Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be God's kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth, Lord God, Heavenly King, Almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, whose Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, is the light of the world, grant that your people illumined by your word and sacraments, may shine with the radiance of Christ's glory, that he may be known, worshipped, and obeyed to the ends of the earth, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from the book of, a reading from the book of Samuel. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his room. The lamp of God had not yet gone out. And Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of god was where the ark of god was of the lord the lord called samuel samuel and he said here am i and ran to eli and said here i am for you have called me for he said i did not call lie down again so he went and lay down the lord called again samuel Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call, my son, lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. The Lord called Samuel again a third time. He got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. 
Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore, Eli said to Samuel, go, lie down. And if he calls you, you shall say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood there, calling out, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, speak, for your servant is listening. The psalm for today is Psalm 139. Lord, you have searched me out and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You trace my journeys and my resting places and are acquainted with all my ways. Indeed, there is not a word on my lips, but you, O Lord, know it, know it altogether. You press upon me behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain to it. For you yourself created my inmost parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I will thank you because I am marvel marvelously made. Your works are wonderful and I know it well. My body was not hidden from you while I was being made in secret and woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes beheld my limbs, yet unfinished in the womb. All of them were written in your book. They were fashioned day by day, when as yet there was none of them. How deep I find my, your thoughts, O God! How great is the sum of them! If I were to count them, they would be more in number than the sand. To count them all, my lifespan would need to be like yours. A reading from the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are beneficial. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy both one and the other. The body is meant not for fornication, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord and will also raise us by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Should I therefore take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that whoever is united to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For it is said the two shall be one flesh. But anyone united to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Shun fornication. Every sin that a person commits is outside the body, but the fornicator sins against the body itself. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, which you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you were bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory to you Lord Christ. Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him about whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus 
son of Joseph, from Nazareth. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, he said of him, Here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, Where did you get to know me? Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the son of The amount of noise pollution around us, even those of us who live in suburbs is, well, deafening. Our background noise includes humming appliances, heating and air conditioning systems, the radio, the TV, your phone blipping and burping at you. Maybe Alexa is speaking to you. The soft hum of your computer's hard drive and even light bulbs emit a little buzz. And that's just inside the house. Outdoors are planes, helicopters, cars, trucks, horns, train whistles. Over in Prospect Heights, it's the firehouse siren that from time to time requires us to pause our worship. Yes, in spring and summer, we feel blessed to hear birds and crickets and katydids, although they make quite a racket. And in winter, we can hear the occasional fly that bumps and bumbles on the windowsill. But in addition to the environmental noise, there's the clatter that goes on in our heads. There's a lot of self-talk going on up there and much of it not very healthy. A lot of recrimination and self-pity, the woulda, coulda, shoulda sort of talk and accusations. You know, if only so-and-so had done such and such for me. And really there's just not enough joy. It's very noisy upstairs in our heads, isn't it? Given the volume of noise, both physical and mental, how does any message pierce that thick cloud of sound with its high and low frequencies? And how could we hear the voice of God? Now, often when you hear people reflect on their prayer life, they will say they try to listen for what God is saying to them. There are all sorts of ways to pray, as we know, from the simplest Jesus prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, a sinner, repeated over and over as a quiet meditative practice. And then there's something like the Korean Tong Soon Kido, which means crying aloud together in prayer. And it is just that. Each person raises a fervent cry to God and a wave of sound fills the church. I've experienced this sort of prayer and you feel it in your bones. And let's not forget that Jesus taught his disciples to go to their quiet place and pray this simple prayer. Our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come. May your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts because we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And although Jesus commended us to pray, to speak directly to God, and by the tradition of the disciples and of the church, we are to make time to do so during our day. Nevertheless, in all these instances, we are doing the talking to God or at God. As one wag put it, our usual position is, listen, Lord, for your servants are speaking. But are we listening for a response? Do we even expect a response? Would we even recognize a response? Sometimes God is speaking, but we don't recognize the voice. Sometimes God speaks first before we are ready and takes us by surprise. And then we have an epiphany. Take for example, the boy Samuel. Samuel was just a child living in the temple in Shiloh as a page, a servant to the elderly priest, Eli. Shiloh was the first center of Israel's spiritual life before Israel had kings, before Solomon built the temple in Jerusalem. The Ark of the Covenant was there and Shiloh was a pilgrimage place. Samuel lived in the temple because his mother Hannah had prayed to God for a child she had not been able to conceive. 
and she promised that if she bore a son, she would dedicate him to God. So when the child was old enough to separate from his mother, which might have been as young as six years old, Hannah and her husband Elkanah delivered Samuel to the temple in Shiloh. And every year, Hannah would go up to the temple uh, with a little robe that she had made for her son when she and her husband visited Shiloh for the annual sacrifice. So Samuel grew up in the presence of the Lord. However, as we heard, he did not yet know the Lord. Then one night, while asleep near the Ark of the Covenant, Samuel hears a voice calling his name, Samuel, Samuel. Naturally, he runs to Eli saying, look, here I am, you called me. And the third time that Samuel runs to Eli, it's the elderly priest who understands what is happening and gives Samuel instructions. So Samuel goes back to bed and waits for the Lord to call his name once again. Then the Lord stood before him and called exactly as before, Samuel, Samuel. This time the boy is prepared. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. You know, that's a prayer in itself. The story of the boy Samuel is a call narrative, the story that explains a prophet's first encounter with God, an epiphany. When he answered to his name with the words, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening, he did not know what he would hear or what he would be asked to do but he was ready at least to listen. Samuel grew up to be a great prophet and a judge for Israel who condemned the wicked, chastised his people's disobedience, anointed Saul as king. And when the Lord grew displeased with Saul, Samuel anointed David while David was just a boy tending his father's sheep. A prophet's call takes a person by surprise, a voice in the night, for example, or a burning bush, or a flash of blinding light at midday, or a vision, or a dream, or a phone call in the middle of the night. The prophetic call comes early to some and later in life for others. A voice calls, but not all are ready to hear it or able to hear it or even want to hear it. For a prophet's role in his or her community can be a dangerous one. A prophet's role is to speak truth to power. Now, this past Friday was Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday. He would have been 92 years old. And tomorrow is the federal holiday dedicated to his memory as a day of service, a day on and not a day off. As Dr. King, as some of you know, was the son of a Baptist minister. His father was the pastor of Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta his maternal grandfather had held the same position. Ebenezer Baptist is an important church in the history of religious congregations in this nation and represents the aspirations of black Americans after the Civil War. It remains an important congregation. Indeed, the recently elected Senator from Georgia, Raphael Warnock, was senior pastor at Ebenezer Baptist Church. Dr. King was encouraged to go into what we might call the family business, that is, to enter ministry. After all, he, like the boy Samuel, had grown up in the presence of the Lord. He was the son and grandson of Baptist ministers. He graduated from Morehouse College, then went to Crozer Seminary outside Philadelphia, where he was one of the very few black students he received his doctorate at Boston University. A few years ago, I read The Seminarian Martin Luther King Jr. Comes of Age by Patrick Parr. It covers the years that Dr. King was a student at Crozer Seminary. It may be the only biography that focuses on this period of his life, and I read it from curiosity, mostly about how someone experiences theological education. King was only 19 when he entered seminary. By the way, he entered college at the age of 15. And it seems he was a bit of a wild child while only a middling student. But he made friends, found mentors, preached in Philadelphia churches, 
and learned to negotiate his way in a mostly white community. After completing his formal education, Dr. King assumed the pastorate at the Dexter Avenue Baptist Church in Montgomery, Alabama. A year or so later, local civil rights advocates who were determined to end racial segregation on the city's transportation system called for a bus boycott. They chose Dr. King as their leader because of course he was articulate, dynamic and young. And also because he was new in town and hadn't yet made enemies. The bus boycott was successful. The buses were desegregated Thereafter, Dr. King organized the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, which gave him a national platform. And from there, his work and his influence grew, as we all know, from local activist pastor to internationally renowned humanitarian. But his family was threatened. His home was bombed. He was hounded by the FBI. He was jailed some 30 times, yet he persevered. He was only 39 when he was assassinated at the Lorraine Motel in Memphis. There are now many biographies of Dr. King and many histories of the civil rights movement, many commentaries on his life, as well as speeches and sermons you can find online. And you can read those for yourself, and you should. Many have called Dr. King a saint, and many have called him a modern day prophet, he spoke truth to power when the prophetic voice had been subdued for a long time in our land. So what was Dr. King's call narrative? When did he hear the call to put his reputation and his life on the line for the cause of civil rights? There is a story that in January 1956, during the Montgomery boycott, he received a threatening phone call late at night. King was at a breaking point and exhausted. He sat at his kitchen table that night and took his problem to God. There he experienced the divine and heard the quiet assurance of an inner voice saying, stand up for righteousness, stand up for truth. God will be at your side forever. He needed God to speak first, then he could act. He listened prayerfully then proclaimed prophetically. Dr. King's plan had been to follow in the footsteps of his father and grandfather as a minister of the gospel. That alone can be a prophetic calling. But Dr. King's prophetic call went beyond the usual role of a preacher to his congregation or his community. In the quiet hours of a sleepless night, he heard the call, Martin, Martin, and he responded, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. God spoke to him and led him to a higher calling, a sacrificial calling. Now, as I said at first, we are surrounded by a thick cloud of noise, actual noise that strikes our ears and the chatter that fills our mind and presently wave after wave of news. Can we find a quiet space, even if it is only for a few moments Away from distractions, I think we should try. Put down the phone, turn off the TV, rest in God's presence for a time, be still. We don't know what this week will bring. We don't know what difficulties we will confront. We don't know what words, perhaps difficult words we may have to say to a family member or a friend. Every day has its own troubles. And there are times when we feel God is silent in spite of all the words we offer up in prayer. But know this, God is still speaking. So just shush for a time. If we are still, perhaps we will hear the voice that calls our name and proclaim the message that we hear. Speak, Lord for your servants are listening. Amen. Let us affirm our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, 
of all that is seen and unseen, we believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray to the Lord, saying, God of love, grant our prayer. We pray for the earth and all people. Make your ways known upon earth, your saving power among all peoples. We pray especially for those in any kind of need or danger through natural disaster, disease, violence, or injustice. God of love, grant our prayer. We pray for the church throughout the world. Guide and govern us by your Holy Spirit, that all who call themselves Christians may be led into the way of truth and hold the faith in unity of spirit, in the bond of peace, and in holiness of life. Strengthen all who minister in Christ's name, that we may be witnesses to your compassion. God of love, grant our prayer. We pray for our nation. Give to the people of our country a zeal for justice and hunger for righteousness, with wisdom and courage to do your will. God of love, grant our prayer. We pray for those who are suffering and have asked our prayers, especially Joyce, Vivian, Patsy, Carol, Janine, Patricia, Vibart, Barbara, Bruce, Carol, Devet, Barbara, Pat, Herb, Herman, Charlene, Mildred, Mari, and Joe, and for the Reverend Miriam and the staff and patients of Trenton Psychiatric Hospital, for John and the staff and patients of Anne Klein Forensic Center, and those we now name. Tim and Judy. Comfort and heal all those who are afflicted in body, mind, or spirit. Give them courage and hope in their troubles. Bless and strengthen those who care for them. God of love, grant our prayer. We pray for this congregation, especially those celebrating birthdays, including Dwight Green, Caroline Pontoriero, Catherine Pontoriero, Scott Van Kuyken, and Maya Halcom, and anniversaries. Strengthen the, the ties that bind us to one another and to our families and communities, so that we may continually serve Christ in one another and love as he loves us. God of love, grant our prayer. We remember those who have died, including Raymond Lazarus. Give to the departed eternal rest. Let light perpetual shine upon them. God of love, grant our prayer. Rejoicing in the fellowship of the Blessed Virgin Mary, St. Luke, and all your saints, we commend ourselves and all people to your unfailing love. 
Accept these prayers, we pray, in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. A prayer for sound government. O oh Lord, our governor, bless the leaders of our land, that we may be a people at peace among ourselves and a blessing to other nations of the earth, to the president and the president-elect, members of the cabinet, to governors of states, mayors of cities, and to all in administrative authority grant wisdom and grace in the exercise of their duties, to senators and representatives, and those who make our laws in states, cities, and towns give courage, wisdom, and foresight to provide for the needs of all our people, and to fulfill our obligations in the community of nations. To the judges and officers of our courts give understanding and integrity that human rights may be safeguarded and justice served. And finally, teach our people to rely on your strength and to accept their responsibilities to their fellow citizens, that they may elect trustworthy leaders and make wise decisions for the well being of our society, that we may serve you faithfully in our generation and honor your holy name. For yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. Amen. And now as our Savior taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. May Christ, the Son of God, be manifest in you, that your lives may be a light to the world and the blessing of God, our creator, redeemer and sustainer, be with you this day and always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you.